Okay. Yeah. All right. So, hello, everybody. So, it's my honor to welcome you all, and especially our speaker, Sergio Kleinerman from Professor Sergio Kleinerman from Princeton, to the CMSA lecture uh, today. So, this is the Math Science Lecture Series, and Professor Kleinerman is going to talk about the nonlinear stability of curved black holes for small angular momentum. Before we start, maybe a, a quick remark about questions. So we will take questions maybe half through the talk, then we, you will be asked to raise your hand and unmute yourself. If you would like to ask a question before that, so please use the chat and I will collect them and ask them uh, in the middle of the talk and at the end of the talk. So thank you very much. And please, Sergio, if you want to start. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I'm very glad to uh, speak uh, at Harvard. Uh, in this particular uh, seminar, uh, and uh, I will be talking about stability of stability of uh, care uh, for small angular momentum. So uh, let me first introduce the main object. Uh, sorry, I don't understand what it works. Uh, doesn't seem to work. Uh, You're trying to scroll? Yeah, I'm trying to scroll. Try escape for and, uh, first and then go back into it. Yeah, even this doesn't seem to work. Not. Okay, escape doesn't seem to work. I have to okay so now it works okay so uh so first of all uh the objects uh of uh, the theory uh, so which are the ob objects of general relativity uh, so we're talking about Lorentzian manifolds. So that means we have a, a manifold M, which is three plus one dimensional, so four dimensions, meaning uh, that uh, there is a space, which is one dimension, uh, sorry, space, which is three dimension and time, which is one dimension. And uh, and Dao does a metric which is Lorentzian, so it has signature minus plus plus plus. Of course, you can also talk about higher dimensions, but uh, the interesting case is uh, the three plus one dimensions. Uh, so uh, so this is a metric. Uh, I will be talking about frames, right? So these are collections of vector fields. It's important to note that uh, the interesting vector field, the interesting frames in general relativity. Are, uh, are not the orthonormal one, like in, in uh, geometry, in Riemannian geometry, but rather null frames. This has something to do with directions of propagations of uh, gravitational waves or any other kind of waves. Um, then uh, connection, which uh, is the levi civita connection, which simply takes uh, covariant derivatives of the frame relative to the frame. So these are the, the gamma coefficients. Uh, there is a curvature, uh, which is uh, the Riemann curvature tensor. Uh, Ricci tensor, which is just a, a trace of the Riemann curvature tensor. Uh, and another thing that uh, needs to be talked about is asymptotic flatness, which is very important in general at relativity. It refers to... Uh, Sergio, Sergio yes. sorry, um, did you already scroll down? We see the title page right now. So were you able to scroll down on your screen in the file? So can, can I go? Yeah, is it okay? Can you see what, I, what I'm scrolling? Uh, we see the title page right now. And now? Still. Ah. I think you may want to uh, stop share and then reshare your screen. Yeah, because on my screen, I, I could see uh, the right thing. So, sizing. What about now? 
Okay, now it's the second page. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, uh, so again, I'm sorry. I apologize. So let, let's do it again then. Uh, so we talk about uh, Lorentzian geometry. We have uh, manifolds, which are C plus one dimensional. We we have the metric, which is Lorentzian frames. <coughs> uh and as i explained the interesting kind of frames in in general relativity uh are null frames not orthonormal frames uh, we'll discuss about this later uh connection which are just covariant derivatives of the metric relative to the metric uh, relative to the frame curvature the usual curvature tends exactly like any money in geometry ricci tensor which is just a, a, a a trace of the Riemann curvature tensor. And uh, I mentioned as asymptotic flatness, which means basically uh, that uh, your manifolds away from some compact set look uh, like Minkowski space. So Minkowski space, you have to think about Minkowski space as, a, as sort of the, the basic example of uh, Lorentzian manifolds. Uh, obviously, it's a space time of uh, special relativity, plays a very important role. Uh, and uh, uh, asymptotic flatness is, is a way. Excuse me. This is a problem with, uh, with Zoom that you get all sorts of. Uh, Disrupt, dis, disruptions. Okay, so asymptotic flatness, uh, as I said, refers to uh, uh, manifolds which outside the compact set look like Minkowski space. Uh, and uh, from a physical point of view, of course, uh, it refers to, to uh, any kind of uh, physical system which uh, is concentrated somewhere uh, in, in space time. And as you go to infinity, uh, things settle down to uh, to flat space. All right, so this is uh, 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 Ricci manifold. So the, the real objects of general relativity are solutions of the, of the uh, so-called uh, Einstein equations, so Einstein field equations. I'm not going to talk about the Einstein field equations. They refer to, uh, to uh, an equation which involves both the metric and uh, some matter in uh, the space-time. Uh, I, would talk, I would talk instead about the, the vacuum case. So this is the Einstein vacuum equations, which takes a very simple geometric form, Ricci equal to zero. <clears throat> so that's the kind of equations that I, I'm talking about, Ricci equal to zero. Uh, it's a, obviously a complicated system of equations, and it, it, in many ways, it, it really has, uh, it, it involves the most interesting uh, geometric effects of the theory, and say mathematical or geometric. Initial data sets, uh, so Einstein equations are hyperbolic, that's, uh, it takes maybe some time to see it, but they are hyperbolic, this is a reflection of the fact that the metric is Lorentzian, unlike the Riemannian case where uh, the equations would be essentially elliptic. Uh, we have initial data sets as a consequence. So just like, uh, like uh, any, any, any uh, wave equation, you, you set up an initial condition. Uh, uh, initial data, uh, so they are called initial data sets. So this is sort of the picture. You, you see a space time and in it, you see a hypersurface, which is actually uh, what's called a space-like hypersurface, meaning that the normal at every point on the hypersurface, uh, well, if you take at that point, you take the light cone uh, corresponding to, to the Lorentzian metric. If you take the light cone, the normal at that point will uh, point in the interior of the light cone. Uh, so this, uh, this is a hypersurface, which is space-like at every point. So, uh, so if you have a space-time, uh, you can talk about uh, in the hypersurface, which is space-like, you can talk about the induced uh, metric and second fundamental form. And this is actually uh, what is called an initial data set. So uh, the initial data set has to also satisfy some constraint equations, which I'm not going to talk about it. They are extremely interesting in their the own right. There are lots of 
there's a lot of interesting mathematics uh, just about the constraint equations. But uh, uh, I will assume that I have initial conditions, I have the constraint equation satisfied, and uh, uh, we want to construct the space time. So there is a, a fundamental result of uh, Bruhat, 1953, complemented by a result of Garage, which associates to any initial data set, which you, you have here, uh, plus constraints, it associates uh, uh, a space time. In fact, it associates what's called the maximal future global hyperbolic development of the space time. In other words, a space time which goes as far as you, you can go. Uh, and of course, you can make that mathematically very, very precise. So, uh, so this is the first fundamental result uh, in general relativity in terms of uh, the initial value problem. Uh, once you have that result, then you, you can say that essentially any problem in general relativity is a problem uh, about this maximal future global hyperbolic development. In, a, in other words, you are interested in the nature. Uh, does it have singularities? Uh, can, does it extend for all time? Is it complete? And so on and so forth. So all, all questions refer to questions about this maximal future global hyperbolic development. Uh, so the next big thing, uh, Whenever you have an interesting equation like this one, you obviously uh, are interested in special solutions, solutions which have special symmetries. The most interesting ones are uh, so-called stationary solutions, meaning solutions that in some sense do not depend on time. Of course, time is relative in general relativity, so you have to make uh, precise what that means. But this can be made very precise. Uh, I'm not going to get into this. And uh, uh, so once you have a, a good definition of stationary solutions, uh, you can actually find such solutions. And of course, there is a very famous Kerr family discovered in 1963. Uh, so this is a, a family of solutions of uh, these Einstein vacuum equations, depending on parameters A and M. So there are two parameters. Uh, and there is a condition here, which if it's violated, uh, then somehow, uh, the corresponding care will be uninteresting from a physical point of view. So this is a, the condition that we are always going to impose. Uh, so that's, uh, uh, these are the stationary solutions. I should say uh, here that I'm not going to talk at all about the so-called cosmological uh, case when you have uh, Ricci not equal to zero, but Ricci equal to lambda which is called the cosmological constant times the metric. So in other words, uh, the, the equation is not really this one, it's a different one. Uh, this is a, also an extremely interesting case, uh, but it differs substantially from uh, the case we are interested in here. In particular, you cannot talk about uh, isolated systems anymore. I mean, things don't look Minkowskian at infinity, uh, but they look, uh, they, they, they look different. They, they look like Kervesita, which is a... a Another special story. So anyway, I'm not going to talk about this case. There are very interesting results, in particular, all the results of Friedrichs and some recent results of Hintz and Bassi, uh, which I'm not going to talk about. So uh, let's, let me go now, finally, to uh, the main topic of uh, this lecture, which is stability of care. So this is a conjecture, uh, small perturbations of a given sub-extremal care, so that means absolute value of A is less than M, uh, and in initial conditions, so I have to explain what this means, have maximal future developments converging to another care solution. So let me try to explain. So first of all, here you have a picture, uh, or at least part of the picture of a care solution. So, so uh, I will say more about this uh, later, but for the moment, let, let's just uh, look a, li a little bit at the picture and try to understand what's going on. First of all, you have these uh, two values of R. So there is a function R uh, that uh, plays an important role here. Uh, so you have the values R equal R plus, R equal R minus, and R equal infinity. R equal infinity corresponds to this, uh, what is called scry plus, so you have to think about the fact that this is actually a conformal compactified picture of the care solution, right? So care solution, of course, is, is um, infinite, uh, but um, uh, by a conformal compactification, we make the boundaries to 
to look uh, like this one. Everything at, uh, it's very important to say, everything at 45 degree corresponds to null rays, uh, right? So null rays uh, are uh, the, the ones for which the matrix of at every point where you, you measure the tangent to a, a ray, uh, the corresponding tangent should be null relative to the matrix. So everything, uh, everything at 45 degrees corresponds to null rays. Uh, the region here beyond r equal r plus, r equal r plus is called the event horizon. The region beyond here is called the black hole. Uh, they, there are two domains of outer communication. Domain of outer communication is, is whatever it's outside the black hole. There are two domains of outer communication. There is this one and this one. Uh, let's forget about uh, this and oh, I'm going to or, or only concentrate on this domain of other communication and maybe the black hole. The uh, conjecture refers to the outside, in other words, for the domain of other communication. All right, so now let's talk about the initial condition. So what do I mean by initial condition? Well, I take care, I take a hypersurface through care, which looks like this. It's a space-like hypersurface. Again, space-like means that uh, whenever you take uh, the null cons to a point, the tangent to the hypersurface uh, points in towards uh, the interior of the light line. So this is a space-like hypersurface. In CARE, I, I look at the initial data induced by CARE on this space-like hypersurface. I'm only interested in, again, as I said earlier, I'm only interested in, in the region outside the black hole. Maybe I'm going to go a little bit beyond the black hole, but I don't need the whole uh, hypersurface here. I just stop somewhere. And uh, I, as I said, I look at the initial conditions induced by care and make a small perturbation, but general, an arbitrary general perturbation of care, small. And uh, the question is what happens uh, with the evolution of this, uh, of this perturbation? So I can talk about the maximum future global hyperbolic development, as I had in my previous slide, of this, uh, of this uh, initial condition, of this perturbed initial conditions. And then the question is, what happens in the large? So lots of terrible things can happen. Uh, you can have singularities. You, 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 you can never continue the solution for all time. The, the conjecture, and it's quite a remarkable conjecture uh, in the sense that, uh, that uh, well, you, you actually prove the stability of this picture, uh, meaning that uh, the solution of the perturbed initial conditions are going to behave in the large like another care solution. Not necessarily, you don't necessarily converge to the, the one you started with, but uh, you would converge to uh, a different care solutions with different parameters. So if you start with A and M, the uh, final parameters may be AF and MF. And these are parameters that you actually have to find. So proving uh, the conjecture also means finding these parameters. And that's uh, one of the reasons why the problem is hard. So the, the theorem that I want to talk about it, uh, which is a new recent result uh, with Jeremy Seftel from Paris, is that uh, the conjecture is true if A is much less than M. In other words, if you have so-called A corresponds to an angular momentum. Uh, so if the angular momentum of the black hole, so if the rotations of the original care solution is sufficiently small, then uh, the conjecture is correct. Right, so that's the main uh, result that I will talk about. Uh, so uh, first of all, uh, just that I, I need to mention that in the context that I'm interested in, in other words, solution of the Einstein vacuum equation. So remember, this is Ricci flat, so Ricci equal to zero. So in the context uh, of this, uh, I, I need to compare this result with previous results. So first of all, the first major result in, in this, uh, of this category was stability of Minkowski space, uh, proved between 1990 and 1993. This is where the, the book has appeared. So it's a whole book dedicated to this. So this is a result of uh, Christodoul and myself. Uh, then uh, the next uh, result of this type is a stability of Schwarzschild under polarized perturbation. So you, you make restrictions of the initial uh, conditions. You assume that they are polarized. Okay, never mind exactly what it means. Uh, the important thing is, is that uh, once you assume polarization, then 
you are perturbing a, a, a Schwarzschild solution. So Schwarzschild, by the way, I, I guess I didn't say. So Schwarzschild, of course, corresponds to the case when A is equal to zero. So when A equal to zero, this Kerr solution is called Schwarzschild. Of course, this family of Schwarzschild solution was discovered uh, much earlier than uh, Kerr. This was already in 1915. So uh, uh, the whole point of this polarization condition is that uh, uh, you are converging to another Schwarzschild solution. In other words, you take A to be zero here, and the final A will also be zero, which is not true in general. So if I make a general perturbation, I expect that both uh, AF and MF will be different from zero. So it will be different from the original ones. So I start with A and M, and I'll get a different AF and a different MF. So, uh, the polarization ensures that the final state will also uh, be a Schwarzschild solution. So that's what that's that was an impl important simplification. Nevertheless, the, the result was uh, was very difficult, and it was a very important step in proving this one. So in fact, uh, this was uh, the proof of uh, this result played a major role in proving this one. Now, of course, this is much harder, but, uh, but main, many of the main ideas already come out in this paper, in this, which is, it's now a book actually. And then uh, I should mention a new result, which was uh, announced uh, just uh, in the last two months uh, by Dafermos, Holtzegel, Rodniansky, and Taylor. So this is a, a, a result uh, which, does not assume polarization, makes another assumption on the initial data. It's a co-dimension three set of initial conditions. And if you make this assumption, then again, you the final state is going to be a Schwarzschild solution. So it's very similar to this one. There are major, I mean, there are some, uh, I shouldn't say major, but, but there are some important uh, differences in, in the result, but I'm not going to talk about it uh, today. Uh, so let's, uh, let I, I want to talk a little bit about the general stability problem, not just general relativity, but other nonlinear equations. So, uh, so for example, so here, here's a nonlinear equation, uh, whatever it is, uh, doesn't matter exactly. It's uh, some functional of phi. So these are solutions, let's say in three plus one dimensions. Uh, and I, I want to solve this problem, n of phi is equal to zero. Uh, so uh, obviously there are certain solutions, which I, I, uh, I write it phi zero. So this will correspond to the Kerr family in the case I studied earlier. So I'm looking at uh, a specific solution, n of phi zero equal to zero, and I want to perturb it. So I'm looking at n of phi zero plus psi equal to zero. So I want to find psi, right? All right, so this is a classical problem appears in many, many areas of mathematics. Uh, and uh, very often you don't have stability. It's re relatively rare that you have stability, but let's first of all say what stability is. So uh, there are three notions of stability, orbital stability, which means that the perturbation that you make uh, remains bounded for all time, as t goes to infinity. So this is called orbital stability. Asymptotic stability means that, that the perturbation actually tends to zero. So in other words, the solution phi zero plus psi converges to phi zero as t goes to infinity. And, uh, and then finally, you have the most complicated one, which is orbital asymptotic stability, uh, which tells you that phi zero plus psi converges to a different solution which is called phi f so this was a situation this was a situation that we had uh, uh, we had here right I, I, as i said the final solution uh, converges to a different cat okay so the it's exactly the situation that we have here all right so uh, so this is a, a simple classification at the level of uh, of nonlinear stability i should say orbital stability by itself is very difficult to establish unless you actually establish something more complicated like asymptotic stability or orbital asymptotic stability. It's very rare that you can prove only this one. Typically, in a nonlinear problem, uh, you have to do either this one or this one. Uh, now, uh, 
uh, obviously the first thing you do when you have a nonlinear equation like this, you look at the linearized equations, right? So, so you take the Fréché, what's called Fréché derivative. This is just a variation, uh, first variation of uh, this equation. Uh, you get something like this. So you get a, a linear system of equation and you are interested in, uh, so it's linearized around phi zero, which is this one here. And uh, we are interested in, uh, in uh, the behavior of psi. So again, there are various types of stability that people look at. The, the mode stability, uh, this is uh, the, the kind of thing that phys physicists usually do. You decompose using the symmetries of the equation. Phi zero typically has symmetries. Uh, you decompose this into, uh, into modes, so do some kind of eigenvalue type problem. Uh, and you show uh, mode stability. In other words, you show that for every mode, uh, you uh, you get boundedness of the modes. No growing modes means that the, the modes themselves are not not becoming say, say exponential, uh, growing exponentially, which would be a, a disastrous from the point of view of stability. Uh, so this will be mode stability, no growing modes. Boundedness would mean that you actually show uh, you go beyond the modes and you show that psi itself is bounded. By the way, bounded modes, of course, does not imply that psi itself, which is decomposed into modes, will also be uh, bounded. So it doesn't give you much information about uh, the actual psi. Uh, but anyway, it's, uh, it's something that usually physicists know how to do. Uh, and very often they declare victory. If, it, if they show that there are no growing modes, they declare victory. In other words, they declare that somehow the solution is stable or the, the corresponding solution phi zero is stable under perturbations. Uh, but that's obviously not enough. Uh, for non linear problem, you need much more. So you need uh, not only boundedness, but you also need quantitative decay. In other words, uh, you need to show that psi itself decays at a rate which is sufficiently high so that the no the nonlinear corrections that you have here, when you have obviously the, the linear problem, but you have nonlinear corrections, the nonlinear corrections have to be under control. That requires typically, requires uh, quantitative decay for solutions of the linearized problem. Uh, so uh, now you can also have uh, zero modes, uh, which I will say a few words about this. So, uh, so uh, you can have solutions of these equations which are just bounded. They don't grow exponentially, uh, but they're, they're just bounded. They correspond to mods. So it corresponds to say lambda equal to zero if you, if you think of in terms of the eigenvalue problem. Uh, and uh, these are the modes that, that lead to orb orbital asymptotic stability in the nonlinear case. Right? So the presence of these modes tells you that you cannot have asymptotic stability in this sense, and you need, in fact, uh, orbital asymptotic stability, which is the situation of Kerr. The reason for this is the presence of various families uh, of, uh, of solutions. So for example, the, the, uh, the fact that you have, uh, say, you want to perturb a specific A, a specific M, the fact that you have nearby, you have a lot of other stationary solutions uh, will imply, and it's very easy to see, will imply that you have some kind of zero modes for the linearized problem. And even more, uh, even more complicated to take into account is the fact that uh, the Einstein equations are covariant, general covariant. What does it mean? It means that given a metric, right? So you are solving for a metric. You, you, you are trying to show that the Ricci of a metric is equal to zero. Uh, so uh, given a metric, you cannot distinguish between the metric G and phi star of G, which is a, the pullback of the metric G or the push forward of the metric G uh, and the arbitrary diffeomorphism of the money for them. Okay? So this also leads to a huge family of zero modes. In fact, Right, this, this is huge because obviously the, the diffeomorphism group of, uh, of the manifold is enormous. Uh, so the consequence, you have a huge family of zero modes and uh, these are the reasons why the problem is incredibly hard. So this is why it took so long. Obviously people were interested in the stability of care from the very beginning uh, of its discovery in 1963. Uh, and you cannot wonder why it took so long uh, to actually prove 
stability uh, for small angular momentum. We still don't have a full stability result. The reason is to a large extent because of this, because of this uh, enormously complicated uh, family of zero modes, which have to somehow be mod out, right? So to mod out in, in the case that I, I mentioned before, to mod out means in some sense to find the, the AF and AM, in as well as to find the final states. You have to know exactly where the solution, which is a perturbation of uh, care, uh, precisely uh, what are the final states, AF and AM. But this is not enough. So the, there is this additional problem. So uh, there is uh, the problem that has to do with this, this, the existence of this two parameter family, uh, which leads to, to zero modes. But uh, uh, the, the general covariance, it's even more complicated. And this has something to do with the fact that in order to talk about decay to the final state, which you have here, uh, the decay itself is not an invariant notion, right? So if you change coordinates, uh, you know, decay, issues of decay will look completely different. So whatever is decay in, in a certain coordinate system may not be decay at all in another coordinate system. So somehow uh, the very nature of the result is such that you can only make sense of this statement if you find the correct gauge relative to which takes place, right? So, so you have, so that is not just to find the final parameter AF and MF, you also have to find the final because it's also going, everything is dynamical. You also have to find the final coordinate system, the final gauge in which you can talk about this uh, convergence with the final state. So this is, uh, these are the main difficulties of the problem. Uh, all right, so, so again, uh, to repeat because of what I said, uh, you have to dynamically define a gauge condition and mechanism to track the final state. In other words, your gauge condition in order to be able to even talk about decay to the final state and uh, find out the parameters of, uh, of the final state, in other words, AF and MF. You need a robust mechanism for deriving sufficient decay for the main linearized quantity with respect to the gauge, as I mentioned. And uh, uh, as an example, uh, I'll, I'll talk about the simplest possible example that we know. Uh, the case, of course, of uh, stability of care is much, much more difficult. But just to get you an idea, uh, suppose I, I have a nonlinear problem where here I have a D'Alembertian, so the wave operator in Minkowski space. So this is the simplest kind of uh, wave operator. And I perturb the equation uh, using this f of psi and derivative of psi. So in other words, it's a nonlinear expression in psi and derivative of psi. And uh, uh, well, th there is a lot knowing about this equation. For example, it's known that, uh, so here you, by the way, you have a size, a scalar, things are much, much more simple. You are perturbing around the zero solution. The expected result is that either psi is unstable and something terrible happens, or psi goes to zero, okay? And, uh, uh, if you are in, in uh, three plus one dimensions, typically this, this problem is unstable. So in other words, psi equal to zero is unstable. You make small perturbations of, uh, uh, of zero initial conditions and you, uh, you blow up, right? The solutions will blow up. Uh, and uh, the reason is because you don't have enough decay for solution of the linearized problem, which is the ambition of psi is equal to zero. Uh, now, uh, there is a condition, however, called the null condition. So this is a structural conditions on the nonlinearity such that uh, uh, that even in three plus one dimension, if that structural condition is verified, then you have global solutions for this one. In other words, psi is stable, uh, is asymptotically stable, meaning that you converge back to psi equal to zero. And uh, the proof is, is based on the so-called vector field method. So, so these are methods which have been developed in the 80s uh, by various people, including myself. So, uh, uh, so we need, in order to be able to deal with problems like this and the more complicated problem of stability of care, we need a version of the null condition. So somehow the nonlinear terms, so if you go back to, if you go back to here, 
uh, you have the linear part, but you'll have also nonlinear terms, and nonlinear terms will have to satisfy the null condition. So, in other words, some kind of structural condition. I'm not going to talk about it now, but um, the important thing is to know that there has to be something special about the nonlinearity. In other words, the nonlinearity of the Einstein vacuum equations has to have a special structure in order to be able to close. Uh, so, uh, version of the null condition. As I mentioned, this is also a gauge dependent condition. So the null condition is verified. It's not a gauge independent thing. So you have to actually find the correct gauge in which the null condition is verified. This is part of the same issue that we discussed here. Uh, and then, of course, the other big thing in this kind of problems is that you need a strategy to disentangle the nonlinear interdependence of all these things. Right? Anyway, so. Uh, the, the first time when, when the, this type of problems was, uh, or, or this, the, this kind of ideas were implemented in general relativity was uh, stability of Minkowski space. So this was uh, my result with Christopher. So uh, stability of Minkowski space really uh, required the vector field method, required the null condition, required a, a choice, a correct choice of gauge and so on and so forth. All right, so now uh, maybe this is a good time actually to ask for questions if people have some questions. Right, so if you have a question, then please uh, raise your hand or, <clears throat> and we will, and then you have to unmute yourself to ask the question. Just unmute yourself and ask the question if you have any. Um, the audience can't actually unmute themselves, so oh, I think sorry. It's easier if, okay. if they use the Q and A box. Okay, so if you have a question, you can type it into the Q and A. Um, if you can type your question into the Q and A, and I will read them for you. Maybe while we give the audience uh, a minute or so to type questions, uh, maybe I can ask something too. So I think the um, vector field method was really um, generalized in a most effective way in, in the Minkowski stability, your work with Chris Tudulu. Maybe you can say something a little bit about the TIR background. So for people who are familiar with PDEs, but not so much with, the, with Einstein's equations. So what the big challenges were there. Right. So. Uh... So think of uh, the simplest uh, equation, uh, which is this one. So you have, let, let's take the, the absolutely simplest thing with the ambition of psi, let's say is, is a gradient of psi squared. Okay, so the gradient of psi squared. Uh, now you, you want to do a stability result, but you need, to first understand the linearized problem. So the linearized problem, uh, well, uh, you have energy estimates, which, which tell you that things stay bounded. So certain norms, which are integral norms, stay bounded. That will not be good enough. I mean, if you just use the boundedness of the energy, uh, the only thing you can hope for is to get a local in time result. So this is, a, in fact, the result of Yvonne Choquet-Bruat was based on, on this kind of ideas. You use the energy estimates, you just have boundedness. You don't get any decay, so you cannot control the nonlinear term, which would be gradient of size squared. So uh, to control the nonlinear term, you need decay also. So you need at the linear linearized level. So if I study just the ambition of say equal to zero, I get decay. And what, now it's known that solutions of the wave equation in dimension one plus n decay like t to the minus n minus one uh, over two okay so uh, so you get uh, you get some decay but very little if you are exactly in three dimension you get t to the minus one so you get decay like uh, of t to the minus one and then the uh, but in order to get this decay you, you use Fourier methods uh, you use a fundamental solution and so on and so on. so the, there was a, a big breakthrough happened when we were able to uh, learn how to analyze solution decay of solutions of the linearized problem so again I'm just talking about the wave operator equal to zero uh, in uh, uh, 
in uh, using uh, uh, methods which do not depend on the fundamental solution. So this was a vector field method. The vector field method uh, achieved exactly that. It, it allowed you by, by some kind of a combination of multiplier type methods. In other words, you, you take the wave equation and you multiply by something or commutations with specific vector fields, which are which are the killing and conformal killing vector fields of Minkowski space. Uh, you can create uh, energy norms which contain those uh, killing and conformal killing vector fields of Minkowski space, and from it you get decay. So in other words, the idea of the vector field method is to uh, to uh, to get decay using methods which are still based on energy type methods but energy type methods combine with commutations so if you do that if you implement it systematically then uh, you you can actually show that if you are in dimension larger than three right in dimension larger than three the decay will be not t to the minus one for example in dimension four three, in other words four plus one then this will be t to the minus three half t to the minus three half will be enough to be able to control quadratic terms here. So in other words, if you are in dimension higher than three, uh, you would get global solutions. In other words, you show the stability of psi equal to zero. If you are in dimension three, that's not good enough. And there are counter examples due to Fish John. So you need, uh, you need uh, in order to get global solutions in C plus one, you need the so-called null condition. So this is a condition which I, uh, I introduced uh, many years ago. A vector field method is, is something that uh, has two parts to it. One goes back to Moravets, to Kathleen Moravets, another part that goes back to me. Uh, and uh, using the using these kind of ingredients, uh, you can treat these kind of problems. And then, of course, much more complicated, you have to go back to the stability of Minkowski space. Now, uh, important thing to realize here is that, of course, uh, when you take solutions of the Einstein equations, uh, if you are not exactly in Minkowski space, you don't have any killing or conformal killing vector fields on which this vector field method was based. So you construct instead approximate killing and conformal killing vector fields. So that was sort of the main idea of this of the retirement. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. So it was really um, introduced in the Minkowski stability by uh, Sergio and, and Dimitri, so that to really get these fields, the decay. Um, I. I have one last um, um, call for questions. So we haven't received anything on the question and answer. If you have a question, please type it into the question uh, panel. I will collect them and we will take another round of questions at the end of the talk. So please feel free to just type your question there. We will collect them and I will read them at the end. Okay. So we haven't received any other questions. Sergio, I think if you're I can call. ready, okay. you continue. Okay, thank you. So, uh, you. okay, so here let's talk about. Uh, I, I have to, unfortunately, uh, in, in order to understand what's going on, you have to really uh, suffer a little bit uh, of uh, formalism. A formalism, of course, is very, very important because, as I said, the, this gauge issue is the most difficult issue that you have to face when you talk about. The Einstein equations. So, uh, so I, I'm going. To, I'm, I'm starting with something very general. I, I'm talking about Lorentzian geometry here. Uh, we have a Lorentzian metric, and uh, the first definition is that of a null pair. So these are two null vector fields. In other words, G is three is three is zero. G four is four is zero. These are null vector fields, and you normalize them by the condition that G is three four is minus two. Uh, then uh, the next thing that I need to talk about, it's horizontal structure. So these are uh, uh, at every point on your manifold, you take E3, 4 and you take the space orthogonal to it. So this is a, a two-dimensional space, which you, I call it uh, horizontal space. Uh, then the next thing is a null frame. So a null frame is a null pair. So this is a fixed null pair on, uh, Lorentzian, on your Lorentzian manifold. And the EA are uh, a frame, a basis of H, which is, in fact, you can take it to be orthonormal in H. H, by the way, uh, H is a space-like uh, 
uh, has a space-like structure, right? Because it's orthogonal to something which is uh, orthogonal to, to null, it's going to give you a space-like structure. So I can take something which is also normal relative to H. So this is called the frame, a null frame. Connection coefficients, so remember connection coefficients just refer to uh, taking covariant derivative of the frame relative to the frame. So you can identify various uh, important uh, connection coefficients. I want to do it in such a way that uh, the definitions are independent on the choice I make of the EA. In other words, it's independent of the basis I choose on my horizontal structure. So these are familiar in the stability of Nikoski space. That's what they were used. Chi AB is a derivative with respect to EA of E4, and here should be B, so EB. The same thing here, but you interchange E4 and E3. And uh, K is an important fact, an important uh, observation. Chi, so this is a, called the second fundamental form, uh, can be decomposed into uh, something which is symmetric relative to A and B and traceless. The trace of this relative to the horizontal structure is zero. The trace part, right, which comes up with a delta AB, this is a Kronecker delta AB. And it has an anti-symmetric part, which is epsilon AB, right? So this is the anti-symmetric epsilon. So epsilon one, two is minus one, epsilon one, two is one, epsilon two, one is minus one. And I call this uh, component here, the asymmetric trace of chi. And the same thing here, right? Now, the important thing to observe is that uh, this condition trace chi A, so, uh, the asymmetric trace of chi and chi bar equal to zero refer are uh, uh, conditions of integrability. In other words, by Frobenius theorem, this simply means that H itself is integral. So in other words, H is, is tangent to, uh, to a hypersurface. And if you, for those who are familiar with stability of Minkowski space, in the stability of Minkowski space, the horizontal structure was integral. So in other words, this, these conditions were automatically zero. So this was zero, this was zero. So the only thing you had were this. And uh, uh, in fact, uh, uh, the, the way various foliations are constructed in stability of Minkowski space was using uh, surfaces. So it's, it was foliation by two surfaces in four dimensional space. Uh, and uh, the, the surfaces uh, were actually compact surfaces, would look like spheres. Uh, so in, in that case, think of it as H being the tangent space to a sphere, okay? This was, uh, we call them sphere foliations and they played a major role in stability of Minkowski space. Now, when you do stability of care, you, I will explain in a second, you cannot use that formulation any longer and uh, you'll see it in a second, why not? All right, so these are the, these are the basic things. Uh, there, there are also curvature coefficients. So you decompose the Riemann curvature tensor in this way. So you see this is E A E four E B E four. It's you call this alpha A B alpha bar A B. Uh, you interchange E four and E three. You complexify. So this is very important. Also, you do a complexification. You write capital X is chi plus I dual of chi. So this is a Hodge dual uh, that it's easy to define. Uh, and X bar is the same relative to chi bar. So, and of course you also have A, capital A is alpha plus I alpha star and so on and so forth. So you can complexify all uh, curvature and uh, connection coefficients. Uh, so this is a complex set. You have uh, the connection coefficients, which are X, X bar, Xi, Xi bar. H, H bar, so H is a combination of eta, and, uh, eta star, uh, and so on and so forth, so omega, omega bar. This, these are scalars, uh, these, are, these are reals, and these are scalars, uh, these are complex uh, uh, one forms, scalars, and so on. Uh, and the curvature also, you see, you have uh, the, exactly these components. Now, you write down the cartan bianchi equation, so the, ba the basic equations that you see all the time in differential geometry also come up in general relativity except of course they, they uh, should be interpreted from a point of view of PDE, should be interpreted differently. Uh, so you have uh, D gamma plus gamma times gamma. So this is a Cartan equation is equal to curvature and DR plus R times gamma is equal to zero. These are the PNK identities. So these are our basic equations. 
Now, I, I, I need to make uh, this comparison of Christodoulou, Brandeman, and Stavridovnikovsky space. I already said, in that case, this, uh, uh, this uh, integrability factors are, are automatically zero, so you don't see them. Uh, so now, uh, the equations that you see here will also contain information. So there are modifications of the equations used in Stavridovnikovsky space, modifications involving these terms, right? Uh, so this is one of the great advantage of this formalism, which we uh, which we, we have introduced, uh, is that uh, it allows you to pass very easily from the case of uh, stability of Minkowski space, uh, the integrable case to the non-integrable case. Now uh, I, I need to make a comparison also with Newman Penrose, and Newman Penrose is 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 uh, the familiar formalism to deal with non-integrable structures, right? So uh, non-integrable structure, so th this would be a situation, so again, where EA is non-integrable. Uh, what Newman-Penrose does is, uh, is actually to take all the connection coefficients relative to all possible choices uh, of E3 for uh, E1, E2. In other words, you take E3 for E1, E2. So somehow the, the formalism is, is heavily dependent on the choice of E1 and E2. Uh, and that's a major difference with, uh, with our formalism. Okay. Uh, that creates all sorts of issues. I'm not going to talk about it. The, the Newman panels will be very difficult. It's very good to use in linear theory. In non-linear theory, it will lead to lots of difficulties, uh, exactly because of this uh, dependence uh, on the frame. So again, the, the formalism which uh, we are using here is independent of the choice of frame. So it's more geometric. Uh, okay, so now let's go back to, uh, let's go to actually the main the main uh, example of a space-time in general relativity, which is a care, care uh, family of examples, because you have a family of care solutions depending on n m. So these are the uh, expression of the metric. So this is a metric expressed relative to some coordinates, which are called boyer linguist T, R, theta, and phi. It doesn't really matter. It turns out that the exact formulation uh, of the, the exact formula here is not too important, uh, but it's good to see it at least once. You see, the remarkable thing is that uh, KAM, so this metric, is a solution of the Einstein vacuum equations, and as well as the of this is equal to zero, highly non trivial if you think about it. Uh, and uh, the remarkable thing is that this is very, uh, in the end, it's very explicit. Uh, so all the coefficients can be calculated explicitly in terms of uh, exactly this. So you, you see you have R and theta. These are the, the most important uh, quantities here. There is also T and phi. Remark that uh, the coefficients uh, that you see are independent of T and phi, right? Which corresponds to the fact that capital T, which is the vector field D over DT in these coordinates, is killing. Right? So it corresponds to a symmetry. This is a stationarity. So uh, th this is a way of saying that uh, uh, care solution is stationary. So uh, this is killing. And it's also axially symmetric, uh, meaning exactly that these coefficients are independent of phi. So th this is a reflection of the fact that uh, this is a stationary solution, which is, which is uh, a rotational invariant. So it has a rotation. But uh, but uh, d over d phi is a kinetic vector field for the for the metric. Okay, uh, sorry. So so this is a picture again, the picture uh, of the space time. Remark that I'm not interested in this part. This will correspond to a white hole, which is physically uh, not very interesting. Uh, again, the the interesting parts of a black hole are the interior of the black hole, which is uh, the actual black hole region the horizon, which is r equal r plus. r equal r plus is just a, a, a root of delta equal to zero. So delta of r plus, you replace r by r plus, you get zero. So this is r equal r plus. Uh, r equal r minus, it's a second root. It also plays an important role in the black hole, but I'm not going to talk about it. We are not interested, we are only interested in r equal r plus. Uh, so uh, again, this is cry, and as well, that corresponds to R equal to infinity. Uh, and uh, as I said, uh, null rays are 45 degrees, 45 degrees this way, and uh, 
and uh, uh, space-like directions are horizontal, time-like directions are perpendicular. Uh, and uh, uh, another important thing to see here that I, I would have to mention later on is that this hypersurface is an out, which is the, the, the hypersurface at infinity, uh, is actually a null hypersurface and it's infinite relative to an affine parameter. So if you define an affine parameter along this, uh, this the length of this is infinite, right? And uh, this is uh, something called called the completeness of scry. So in other words, the scry uh, for the care solution is complete. Okay, so that's that's something important which uh, I will mention later on. Now. Uh, so let's talk about the particular structure of frames in care. In other words, what, what I'm interested in is to show that there exists a specific choice of null frames. So this is a null pair that we discussed before, E4 and E3. They are written like this relative to the coordinates. So they are very explicit. Right? You can also see that D4, E4, is zero in other words e4 is geodesic uh, and uh, and uh, the horizontal space in other words the space perpendicular to this has i can also choose a frame an autonormal frame on them which is uh, expressed like this e1 is this and uh, e2 is uh, this one right all right, so, so this is a very important choice of frames in care because of the uh, crucial fact which I'm writing here. Relative to a principal null frame, this quantity is A, A bar, B, B bar. So in other words, the curvature, all curvature coefficients are zero relative to this frame with the exception of uh, P. Uh, so this is a curvature quantity which can be explicitly calculated again relative to this frame which is uh, minus 2 m over q cube in other words the entire curvature tensor reduces to just this expression uh, which is remarkable in other words you get a remarkable diagonalization and this is the reason why uh, uh, principal null frames are, are, are very very important there is also in addition you have that various quantities uh, of the rigid coefficients are also equal to zero so you get a, a remarkable simplification uh, of uh, the care solution relative to this frame. If you use any other frames, uh, then uh, you get all sorts of complications and it's very hard. It's very hard to do calculations in care uh, exactly because uh, if you just change the frame to something else, you get, you get uh, extremely complicated mess. Okay, so these are, uh, this is what happens in care. In Schwarzschild, you have in addition the fact that E3, E4 is integrable, in other words, the uh, horizontal space, the perpendicular on E3, E4 is integrable. And this is the reason why, uh, of course, in Minkowski, the same thing happens. This is the reason why in stability of Minkowski space, we can work with integrable frame, while here we cannot. So this, uh, these frames are not integrable, right? So the horizontal structure here is not a, uh, an integrable structure. I don't know why it's doing this. Uh, okay, so uh, so in Schwarzschild you have this additional fact: rho, the imaginary part of P, which came here, is also zero in that case, and uh, you have other other things, but I'm not going to talk about. Uh, in Minkowski, in fact, the entire the all curvature uh, coefficients are zero in in Minkowski space, which again it shows you why the stability of Minkowski space is is a lot easier than stability of Schwarzschild or stability of K. All right, so now uh, I come to the issue of perturbation. So I, obviously I'm interested in perturbation of care. Uh, so uh, I'm interested in some kind of structure, uh, matrix structure, which is close in some sense to care. So how can I make sense of it? Well, uh, I mean, I, I have to assume that there exists a frame uh, which is close to the, the one of care. And uh, and then uh, if I go if I calculate the Christoffel symbols, and I subtract the ones of care, I get here a small quantity. So this gamma minus gamma care, in other words, the exact value 
of Christopher symbols of the frame in here will be uh, 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 right the, the explicit formulas in care uh, i know exactly what they are so i can i can subtract it from gamma i get gamma check which is a small quantity the same thing for our check i, I subtract the corresponding value in care and i get something which is off so this is my definition my definition is that there exists a frame there exists a null frame which is in some sense uh, perturbation of the null frame in care relative to which these quantities gamma check and our check are of epsilon. Okay, now the problem with this definition is that, of course, there is millions of types of frames that I can choose. I mean, uh, for example, I can start with a frame, which I call it E1, E2, E3, E4, and I, I make a change of frames. I go to a different frame by some very simple transformation. So this is a general transformation. I, I can calculate exactly what these terms are. Never mind, but uh, I, I, I write them off epsilon squared because, uh, because uh, the f and f bar here are also of epsilon. Lambda is one plus of epsilon. In other words, this is really a small perturbation of the frame I started with. So I start with this three, four, e a, I make a small perturbation. I want the coefficients to be close to, uh, to zero for f, and lambda should be close to one, right? Okay. So, uh, so obviously, uh, which frame I'm going to choose? I mean, they all seem to be exactly the same. If I if I make a if, if I start with this and I make this kind of uh, coordinate transformation, this frame transformation, I get something which looks again like this. So, what did I gain? I gain absolutely nothing, right? I have infinitely many possibilities. How do I choose? Now, there is one remarkable fact, which is maybe enormously lucky fact about uh, the Kerr solution. Uh, which allows you to start, which is that uh, the curvature components uh, and n bar. So remember, these are these are the components here, the, the alpha and then the complexified a. So these components are called the extreme components of the curvature. So the extreme components of the curvature are all of epsilon square invariant. In other words, in in other words, uh, uh, if I make a change of coordinates like this, a change of frame like this. Uh, everything else looks the same way. It looks like all of epsilon. I, I cannot improve, but these particular components are all of epsilon squared invariant. So this is a discovery made by Tokolsky uh, in the 1970s, and he, in addition, he also showed that a and bar, a and a bar, verify decoupled wave equations. So, uh, so you see, uh, what Tokolsky proved is that a verifies a wave equation. G is a, the, the actual perturbed metric. So it's a wave operator corresponding to the metric G applied to A. So this is like the, uh, you know, for the Riemannian geometry, this is like the, the way the, the Laplacian, for example, in Riemannian geometry is being replaced by the wave operator. It's the same formal expression. So you have the ambition of A plus some coefficient involving three, the derivative with respect to E3 of A, and uh, another one derivative with respect to E4, and then some uh, quadratic terms depending on gamma hat and R hat. The quadratic terms, I kind of expect that the quadratic terms are easier to treat. They are not. In fact, the null, some kind of null condition has to be verified, uh, as, we, as we saw before. But in any case, uh, for the moment, I, I'm just going to ignore them and, and try to understand this equation. So uh, it turns out that this equation, uh, though it's a wave equation and is decoupled uh, up to quadratic terms, right? So in linear theory, I can get rid of this and I, I just have this equation. It turns out that the equation itself is not particularly good because it, does, it doesn't have a variation structure. So it doesn't have good notions of energy, uh, which are fundamental in, in doing any kind of estimates. So. Uh, as a consequence, you need to transform this A into a new quantity, which I call Q frac. So Q frac is something which involves the Q. Q, remember, sorry, I guess I, I have to uh, repeat. Q is this R plus I A cosine theta, which uh, uh, makes sense in, in, uh, uh, in the Kerr solution. And it also makes sense in, you can make sense of it in perturbations of Kerr. So, so this is anyway, this is an expression, uh, scalar. This, this is the important part, is uh, derivative with respect to E3 twice of A, derivative 
one of a and, and uh, just a. So this is a, an expression on a involving two derivatives. So it's a very complicated expression. It turns out that if you make this transformation, then uh, you get the so-called uh, 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 what I call GRW equation here. Uh, never mind exactly where it comes from. So th this equation uh, has a better presentation. It looks like, again, a D'Alembertian. Here I put a dot because it, this is the, the D'Alembertian relative to two forms. Q frac is like A, A is a, is a, two, is a horizontal two form. This is also a horizontal two form. You can also make sense of this in, in the language of bundles. Actually, not everything here is in fact a bundle. Horizontal structure is a bundle. So, uh, so you have, uh, anyway, you have a term like this, which depends on A. So uh, when A is equal to zero, you get zero. So in Schwarzschild, this term will not be present. You have a V, which has actually some good, it's a potential because it gets multiplied by, by Q and it has some good properties. And you have some other terms, additional terms here, which uh, I'm going to uh, discuss maybe later on. Okay. Uh, so, uh, so you can see here two interesting things. First of all, in linear theory, where th this term disappears, this term disappears, uh, sorry, this term disappears, uh, you have to treat this type of equation, right? Where A is connected to Q frac through this equation. So it's a coupled, you can think of this as a coupled system between this and some kind of transport equation, right? Because this is a transport equation in D3. Anyway, it's a, it's a complicated nonlinear PD that you have to solve. In linear theory, this, uh, this has been solved by uh, uh, Dafermos, Holzegger, and, and, and Rodiansky, and Ma. Uh, I'll mention maybe a little bit later. What, how much time do I have, by the way? How, how do I stand this time? Uh, right now, it's 12, uh, 10 minutes after 12. So if you want to go on uh, another 10, 15 minutes or so. OK, very good. All right. So anyway, I, I just want to stop a little bit here. Uh, maybe the details are not uh, very relevant. Uh, the important thing is that uh, uh, th this uh, fact that the Tchaikovsky equation separates from everything else up to quadratic terms is very important that you have to pass from the Tchaikovsky equation. This was the equation that the physicists used a lot uh, to get this mode, what I called before mode stability. Uh, you can go to this other equation, which has a much better structure. So th th this actually has some kind of variational structure, at least as far as you ignore this uh, nonlinear terms. So in other words, this, uh, this equation can be treated so this equation can be treated by energy methods, energy type and vector field type methods. So the vector field method uh, can be used in order to get decay for this. And that uh, that was actually established in linear theory, was established by the Fermat and second and Ma separately. So the two independent results. All right. Uh, okay, so here is just uh, another, uh, remark about the kind of structures that you need. So remember that we need, we need uh, an horizontal structure. In other words, uh, null vector fields is three, four, and the space perpendicular to them. But we also need these functions R and theta. In fact, I, I mentioned already uh, in here, that Q is a combination of R and theta. Uh, so uh, we need also, functions of this stuff. In other words, you, you need some structure which, which allows you to compare at every stage, compare with what's happening exactly in care solution. So the care solution has R and theta and has these three, four, and has, of course, this, this frame. So let's go back to see exactly what I mean. Uh, so you see, uh, you see in the care family has the R and theta, you have the Q, which is this combination of R and cosine theta. And the metric is expressed uh, in terms of that. And of course, it has also these frames, uh, which I have here. So, so you have frames and you have functions R and theta. So this is the sort of thing that you, you want to uh, work with in a context of uh, what I call PG structures. So PG structures are structures in which you, you provide 
E3, 4, you provide the H, which is uh, perpendicular to E3, 4, you provide R and theta. The null pair will verify something like this, E4 being geodesic. The scalar R and theta are, are, are transported. You, you, you want to take E4 of R is 1, E4 of theta is 0. This is what happens in care, and you want to keep it for general perturbations of care. And, uh, and then, of course, uh, you construct uh, read the Ricci and curvature uh, answers. You construct the linearized quant quantities. All right, now, you see, these conditions here depend on uh, E4 of R equal 1, E4 of theta equal 0. You have to ask yourself, what, how do I initialize these two functions, R and theta? So uh, R and theta uh, verifies this, so this is one condition, but I still need to initialize. So this is actually the crucial thing that I'm going to talk about now, which is uh, so-called GCM admissible. So the, the GCM admissibility criteria plays a, a fundamental role in, uh, in the whole proof. So let me, let me uh, introduce this notion here, and I don't think I can go much further, but at least I can give you an idea uh, of what it is. So the point is that we want to construct the space time based on a, continua a continuation argument. So I, I want to I, I want to construct a full space time all the way to uh, infinity. This is uh, I plus all the way to infinity. And to do that, I have to start with a notion of approximate space time. So this is my notion of approximate space time. It's a it's a, a, a finite finite space where everything is defined in terms of what I call sigma star. So this uh, sigma star is a space like hypersurface. So uh, I have a space like hypersurface. Uh, and uh, I uh, choose the space like hypersurface to verify the, the GCM admissibility conditions, which I, I would have to explain. So these are my initial initializations. And then I define the frame and the, uh, the functions are in theta. I define from sigma star. So the, the GCM admissibility will allow me to choose the original frame on sigma star and the original function are in theta. And also, by the way, I'm also constructing functions u and u bar, also starting from sigma star. So, all, so the, the GCM admissibility criteria allows me to make all these choices uh, of initial conditions. And they, of course, these initial conditions are fundamental. Nothing can be done. If I don't have the initial conditions, I can't do anything. So, uh, so this is uh, the hard part, how to choose the initial conditions. Once I choose the initial conditions, I, I can transport my frame together with R and theta and together with U, I can transport from here, I can transport all the way to uh, a time-like hy hypersurface. This time-like hypersurface, you, you, you have to think about that it's, it's relatively close to the horizon. Uh, so, I mean, obviously the horizon is uh, uh, the horizon of the space-time to which you converge, which a priori you don't know what it is, but you can talk still about about something which is, in principle, should be close to it. So th this is my, my T. Uh, of course, I can define it precisely where that is. Uh, so in other words, I construct everything, the frame and all the other quantities up to T. And then once I'm at T, relatively close to the horizon, I go in the opposite direction, right? So I, 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 I uh, instead of using Instead of using uh, d4 e4 equal to zero and e4 of r and e4 of theta, I'm going to use the e3. I'm going to replace e4 by e3, uh, and uh, this will allow me to go uh, right. So I, I go this way with uh, with my transport. I I find some, I find my structure here on t, and then I use that structure in order to go in the other direction. Uh, th this is uh, this is important because uh, the the frame that I'm using starting from here will start degenerating near the horizon. So I cannot I cannot I cannot go all the way up to the horizon. Uh, I have to at some point I have to stop and go in the opposite direction. Right. So in in other words, uh, I'm constructing a geometric structure. Uh, starting with sigma star, everything, once I have sigma star, everything is determined. So uh, the frame, the, the functions are in theta, the functions u and u bar, they are all determined uh, all the way in, inside my, uh, my space time. 
Okay, and then there is an issue of uh, what is this GCM structure, which I won't have time to talk about it. So, I unfortunately, uh, it's it's uh, I'll have to go very fast. So the sigma star. So I have to define something initialization on sigma star. I start with a star. So the first thing that I have to do is to construct a star. So a star uh, is to satisfy these GCM conditions, which uh, are defined relative to a uniformization. So I define a, uh, through the theorem on uniformization of metrics on two spheres. I define a uniformization. I define uh, my coordinates theta and phi uh, and the coordinate r, right? So you see already this defined certain coordinates here. I can define the frame also. Uh, I'm using the so-called effective uniformization, which is a concept that goes back to Aubin. Uh, so in uh, relative to this uh, theta and phi, I can define these functions, g0, j minus, and j plus. This corresponds to the, the spherical harmonics in, in for standard sphere. They are nothing else but the, the, the spherical harmonic, the first spherical harmonics. And uh, uh, the uniformization is chosen in such a way that the integrals of these functions are exactly identically equal to zero. So this can be done. This goes back to Aubin. And we have developed this idea further in a paper uh, with Jeremy Seftel. Uh, the, the definition here, this uniformization, allows you to also define a, a final angular momentum and the final mass. So this, uh, this A and M, so I mean, if you wonder how you define the final mass and the final angular momentum, this is how you define it. So you define it first on a star. And once they are on a star, uh, once I define them here, I can transport them along sigma star by a very simple procedure. Uh, and then uh, from sigma star, I transport them back to here. So this will define the values of A of the final A, A and final A, M everywhere in my space. Now, of course, I, I go all the way to T and then I go opposite in the opposite direction. So, uh, so the, there is a procedure which allows me. Okay, this is not enough. I, I need also to pick the uh, the so-called Schwarzschildian coordinates. I need to pick the gauge, and uh, uh, just to make a long story short, uh, I pick the gauge such that exactly three quantities are are take the values that uh, that you uh, you you have in Schwarzschild. So, in other words, I fix three quantities to be exactly like in Schwarzschild. It's a little bit more complicated and I won't have time to talk about it. So let me, uh, let me, uh, anyway, but this GCM procedure is a fundamental, uh, is a fundamental fact. All right, so here's a strategy, uh, the overall strategy in, la, in, in, in view of what I just said. First of all, expect to be able, the, the quantity A, which is this curvature quantity, is relatively independent of the frame. It doesn't depend too much on the frame, which plays a fundamental role because uh, if I had a wave equation which is which dependent on the frame, I will not be able to do any kind of estimates which are useful. So, so this is very important. It, it verifies a uh, wave equation depending on GRW. Uh, of course, the error term depends on all the quantities. So you have to, you, you can only close uh, the equation for A, which by the way, let me go back. So the equation for A here obviously has these terms on the right-hand side, which depends on all the other quantities uh, in the problem, right? So it contains on, on gamma coefficients and, and the curvature coefficients. So th these quantities are, are now gauge, are not gauge invariant anymore, right? So they depend fundamentally on the choice of gauges that, which I make, which means depends fundamentally on, on the, choices that we make here, in particular, the GCM uh, admissibility criteria. Uh, okay, but in any case, uh, the, the, the important thing is that uh, A verifies itself an equation, which has in the right-hand side, it has these terms. To control gamma check and R check, we need this appropriate PJ uh, condition, initialized on sigma star, in other words, uh, the GCM admissibility criteria. Uh, and uh, the, the gauge is chosen on, on S star and sigma star, is chosen using GCM conditions, which I, I, I mentioned. Set up a continuation argument. In other words, I, I, want, to, I, I want to be able to, sorry, excuse me. I, I want to be able to 
continue my space time, right? So I, I have a fixed space time. I, I want to be able to show that I can construct a larger space time, provided that, of course, certain good estimates are already established in uh, the original press. So this is the, the usual continuation argument. Uh, I, I need some bootstrap assumptions, and I have to show that the bootstrap assumptions are improved, and so on and so forth. Um, uh, so this is a continuation argument depending on uh, uh, a certain number of derivatives k large for which I only have to prove boundedness and decay for a relatively small number of derivatives, which is about half of k large. Uh, and uh, we need to construct these GCM spheres and hypersurfaces. All right, so uh, do I have five more minutes? Let's do that, yeah. <laughs> okay. Right, so uh, so let, let's. Uh, I just want to talk about the main theorem and maybe mention a few things about the main theorem. So here, obviously, uh, at the end of, I mean, once you understand what's going on, you can actually state the result, which is uh, very concrete. Uh, and uh, obviously, I will only be able to give some features of it. First of all, there are some constants, a0, m0, epsilon0, k large and k small. So a, a0 and m0, these are the coefficients of the care that you want to perturb. Epsilon0 is a, the size of the perturbation. k large refers to a large number of derivatives, k small refers to a small number of derivatives. Uh, assume uh, that you have some initial conditions, which, uh, well, it's not the usual initial condition, so I, I mean, this requires some explanation. But in any case, assume that you have some initial conditions uh, where you include, I, I don't say exactly what this norm is, it's some kind of norm. Uh, assume that you include k large derivatives plus a little bit more, and you make them to be less than epsilon zero squared. And then uh, you show that the initial, so this is the initial layer, the initial conditions or initial layer are just about the same thing. So uh, you have initial conditions uh, lead to, by development, to an admissible future complete space-time. So uh, that means a space-time which looks like this, right? which is, uh, uh, you can talk about uh, this cry plus, in other words, you make again a conformal compactification. And again, this cry plus is going to be complete. In other words, relative to an affine parameter, I can go all the way to infinity. So this is a this is a global space time in in the region which is outside. This is the horizon. Right? So th this is the horizon of the new space time. Right now, again, as I mentioned earlier, the horizon you can only find after you have made the whole construction because the horizon is defined from this point. You go down from this point. So once. Once I reach infinity in this direction, I can talk about uh, the horizon. Uh, and uh, this is how my whole space time is going to look like. This is a T which divides the exterior part of the manifold to the inferior part. Remember that we were going like this, and from here we're going this way. Uh, and uh, uh, okay, so th these are uh, in the main theorem. There are various uh, decay conditions verified by uh, by components of the curvature. So these are curvature decay, very similar to the the one the curvature decays in a very similar way as in uh, stability of Minkowski space. Uh, the only thing is that in the interior you get lower decay. So uh, for the people who know uh, about stability of Minkowski space, the interesting uh, case is when U is bounded. So U is like an optical function. When U is bounded, you get the decay uh, R, to the, uh, R to the seven half plus a little bit more, R to the minus seven half plus a little bit more. Uh, but in the interior, uh, where, uh, in other words, where R is like one, the decay is only like uh, U to the one plus delta. Okay, so, uh, and finally, uh, there's a, there is a Hawking and bonding mass that you can talk about it. Okay, so this is a, these are things which were known from before, even in stability of Minkowski space, we can make sense of it. The, the important thing is that the bonding mass converges to what is called uh, the Hawking mass. Sorry, the Hawking mass converges to what I call, uh, what we call bonding mass, excuse me. 
So this is a Hawking mass. The Hawking mass converges to the Bondi mass as you let R to go to infinity, in other words, on sky. And, uh, and then you take uh, the limit of the Bondi mass and you get the same infinity. In the stability of Minkowski space, this would have been zero. And now it's, it's different from zero. You can show that the final mass is, is actually the mass of a, of a black hole. Uh, there is an issue of angular momentum. How do you define the angular momentum? Uh, using these GCM conditions and the uniformization, you can also define uh, something similar to here, which corresponds to this, uh, the J, if you remember the J, where uh, these uh, things which are defined in terms of uniformization, of the effective uniformization, they correspond to uh, L equal one mods, uh, let's say for in the standard sphere, sorry, uh, of the, from the standard sphere. And uh, so you can define also the final value of uh, the angular momentum through these kind of limits. So everything is well defined. Uh, this will construct for you the space time, construct the right gauge, and constructs uh, uh, the final values of uh, infinity and infinity. And uh, unfortunately, uh, I have to stop here. I wanted to say more, but uh, it's already. Thank you. Thank you, Sergio. So let's thank the speaker for an interesting talk. And I have a few questions here. So let me read them in the chronology in which they came in. Yes. Uh, OK. All right. So uh, the first question uh, we received is about um, well, the Newman Penrose picture, and we have the Christodoulou Kleinemann picture, of course. So, one question is about the Gerosch held Penrose formalism, which is another formalism uh, variation, if you like, of the Newman Penrose question. So, one question is would that new for that other formalism help to circumvent the gauge dependency? Um, I don't know quite which gauge dependency is meant, but um, yeah. Um, the question said that the remark was well, made clear uh, about the gauge dependence. So what, what could you say about that? Well, OK, so I, I, I must say I, I am not entirely sure, uh, but uh, here is uh, the main point. You see, if in the Newman Penrose and various other kind of formalism, which uh, were developed later on, I mean, Gerold, what was it that you mentioned, Gerold and? Heard. But, okay, so they still, if I understand correctly, they are all based on scalars. At the end of the day, what you get are complex scalars, right? And uh, here, if you look at this formalism, you see that they are not scalars at all. I mean, for example, the chi, the x is a two-form. It's an horizontal two-form. The same thing x bar is an horizontal two-form. A is an horizontal two-form, right? So if you look at, if you look at all the convection coefficients, th these are uh, two forms. These are one forms, these are one forms, and these are scalars. While uh, in, uh, in other words, these are tensorial quantities, horizontal. So the, you have to think in terms of bundles. I mean, these are all bundles of quantities. Uh, while I think in the, the, the formulation of Newman panels and all the other variations, the, the variations are, are better in many ways, but I still, they still depend on just scalars, which means if they depend on the scalars, it means they depend on the particular frame that you actually particular horizontal frame, the components of the horizontal frame. OK, yeah. So I'm not sure if this, this answers the question. OK, so uh, if the person has it's very important questions. in instability of Minkowski space, as you, you know very well, in the instability yeah. of Minkowski space, so, you know, this horizontal structure is extremely important. Right, absolutely, right. OK, if there is a follow up question, the person may want to follow uh, up on that. I'm going to read the next question. So one person wanted to know uh, if you could recall the Goursat problem. The, the Goursat problem? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Why? I mean, what? Well, I don't know. I think um, whoever um, the person who asked the question, I don't know, might not. OK. Okay, let, let, let me try to, I mean, I, I think I understand where this is coming from. Uh, you see, uh, right, so let, let, let me go back uh, to this picture, actually. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let's go, let's go back to this picture. So you see, originally, you give the initial conditions on the sigma zero, right, which is a space-like hypersurface. And of course, the, the result was stated in terms of initial conditions on sigma zero. But then later on, I, I take about, uh, about initial conditions in in this uh, 
initial layer, what I call L0, is sort of initial layer. So what, what's a connection between this and this? Well, the point is that there, there, there is a result, uh, there, there are certain various results, in particular my results with uh, Niccolo, uh, so Niccolo Kleinerman, where you pass, you prove that uh, uh, if I give an initial data set and I'm sufficiently far away uh, on, on, towards infinity on sigma zero, I can construct a portion of the space time, which is this one. So in other words, initial data will allow you to go all the way to this hypersurface if, if you take this point sufficiently far on sigma zero. Uh, or if you take initial data set to, to be sufficiently small, you can take, if the initial data is sufficiently small, then you don't need to make any special condition on, on sigma zero. So in any way, you can determine this part. And then uh, on, on this side of, of the, because we are perturbing the care solution on the, this, this region here, uh, this part is actually a finite region that can be proved by the local existence result. So in other words, I can go from initial data on sigma zero, I can go to initial data in this layer, right? So the, the layer is constructed uh, on this part by, by the, the usual local existence result and this part by my result is Nicola. Right? So, so we can sort of imagine that my space time is already determined here and here. It's what I call by initial layer. And I, I, there is no Gursa problem to talk, to, to talk about because everything, uh, the initial data that I have in, in this boundary layer is exactly the initial data that comes from a space like that surface. So uh, everything that has to do with local existence is automatically verified. Right. So I hope I hope that this answers your question. So there is no Gursa problem uh, in DC. I, I never have to solve a Gursa problem here. Gursa problem, by the way, for those who don't know, the a Gursa problem is one in which you give data, instead of giving data on a space like hypersurface, you give data on, uh, on two null hypersurfaces intersected like this. Right, so I will give data here and here. Okay. But that's not what I do. I, I start with data here, and I, I, I have already the space time constructed here. here. So I, I use the information that comes from that space time. OK. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, myself, I lost internet for a moment, but I'm back. Sorry. OK, we have the next question. And the question is about the GCM construction that you introduced. Yes. Um, and the question was, well, with the GCM construction, um, um, could you also apply this to study fields on curve through the Tchaikovsky equation? So for, exam for example, Maxwell fields? Or is there a relation to the structure and also the BMS at null infinity? Well, the, the, the GCM is, is, uh, is really connected to the metric, the fact that the, the metric itself varies, right? So it, it's, a, it's a condition directly related to the metric. So if you have a Maxwell equation in a fixed background, the story is quite different. I mean, there, there will be certain choices that you have to make, but they are at a linear level. I mean, the important point here is this GCM condition is they are highly nonlinear. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I mean, yeah, by the way, I didn't quite say, maybe I can say a few words about uh, how the GCM uh, construction uh, shows up. Of course, initially, you know, I give you a space time where the GCM conditions are verified here. Right, using those GCM conditions, I can. And, and but by the way, we have of course initial data uh, in terms of expressed in terms of this parameter epsilon zero smallness parameter epsilon zero. Uh, uh, I I impose uh, how the continuation argument works. I I impose a bootstrap assumption. In other words, I make I assume that certain norms which have to be very well specified are smaller than some epsilon, not epsilon zero. And then using the GCM conditions, I show that everything here is expressed in terms of epsilon zero. Uh, then I show that everything in, inside is also expressed in terms of epsilon zero. In other words, I recover 
all the bootstrap assumptions, I recover with a better constant. And to do that, I need in an essential way to use the GCM conditions. And also I need to use this, uh, this, uh, this uh, uh, GRW equation that I mentioned earlier. So I have to do estimates for, for that equation, which are crucial. Uh, so if I, if I do all that, I can recover everything inside. Now, once I have recovered everything inside, I can extend the space time a little bit. So I can ex expand the space time a little bit more. Uh, but of course, the extension does not satisfy the GCM conditions anymore. So in the extended space time, which I still control because I, I have very good control on the extension, I, I have to extend just a little bit. Uh, I have to construct a new S star and the new Sigma star. And that's where the GCM conditions, the GCM construction is highly non-trivial. Okay. Thank you. And I have one more question from the audience about the optical function U bar. The, um, is this defined in the exterior region of M? Well, so U is defined, U is defined in MX. In other words, I start, I start here on sigma star. So I define a foliation on sigma star. And uh, from that foliation, so I have two surfaces. I, I construct, uh, I look at the E4. Right, so I have E4 constructed here. I geodesically transport E4, so I get D4, E4 equal to zero. So in other words, E4 would be defined everywhere in this region. And then I, con I, 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 I do, uh, I construct uh, E4 of U. I solve the equation E4 of U is equal to zero. When I solve that equation with, of course, initial data, which are given on sigma star, the corresponding U is not going to be an optical function. By the way, it doesn't satisfy the diagonal equation. It, it, it's, it, it's, it's only a, asymptotically null, right? So U is in fact space-like and it's as, asymptotically null. Anyway, so this is the, the way U is defined. And then from here, I define U bar. So U bar is defined only in the interior, in the interior region. Oh. U is defined in the interior, U bar is defined in the interior. Interesting. So um, these are the questions from the audience. I have one question that uh, came to my mind. So you mentioned that um, the result also depends on some forthcoming work in a wave equations on uh, cur uh, perturbations. Good. It's a what good exactly uh, do you need from there? Yeah, it's a good question because it allows me to <laughs> do something that I yeah, yeah. need to do and I couldn't. OK. so. Uh, Right. Okay. So you see, uh, so proof of theorem. Uh, so by the way, what I was not able to show you is a step by step. What are the main steps in the proof of the theorem? Mm -hmm. uh, but one of the steps, and uh, this is actually step one. So we call it theorem M1. Uh, it's very similar to uh, the proof of stability of Schwarzschild. We have theorem M1 and two and three and four, where at every every stage you prove some some important aspect of the main theorem. So theorem M1 is, uh, is uh, to deal with this GRW equation. So th this is the equation, if you remember, it depends on this A, uh, LQ of A are linear terms in A. Anyway, uh, the equation has all sorts of problems that already were, were known even in the case of the wave equation in care. First of all, you have degeneracy near the horizon. Then you have a non-trivial ergo region because you are in care. So the, the, uh, the vector field T, the vector field T of course is, is this uh, Keeling vector field corresponding, which in care is exactly D over DT. Uh, this becomes space-like near the horizon. So there is an entire ergo region where T is space-like. And of course T is used in the energy conservation and uh, uh, the fact that T is time-like everywhere is very important to get positivity. If T is space-like in a certain region, you don't have positivity. So this is a major difficulty. Another major difficulty is uh, that you have trapped null geodesics. Uh, so uh, you have a, a, a large region of trapped null geodesic. In Schwarzschild, this, this trapped null geodesic reduced to something which is just a hypersurface, which is called R equal, it's R equals 3M for those who know. It's, a, it's just one, specific hypersurface. But in, in care, you have a whole region of Srapnel geodesic. So this is a major difficulty. Uh, you have limited symmetries in care, uh, unlike in Mikowski space, where you have a lot of Keeling and conformal Keeling vector fields. In, in care, you have very little. In fact, you have only the Keeling vector fields T and Z. 
and you have the usual degeneracy at null infinity, which means the, 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 you, the decay rate is only like t to the minus one, roughly, or r to the minus one. Uh, in addition, you have, of course, the presence of terms in A and uh, the presence of nonlinear terms, which are here. All right, so uh, now, if you are in Schwarzschild, this equation simplifies quite a bit. So you don't have the terms in A, so you just get the wave vibrators uh, in the minus of This potential has a good sign, so it's actually helping you. Uh, the trapping reduces to R equals 3M, you have no ergo region. And in that case, you can implement the decay estimates for solution of the wave equation using just computations with various vector fields. Uh, I'm not going to, to do it here, but it's all a vector field type method in the end. It's what I call the new vector field method. and uh, uh, this has been, there are many ideas which have been introduced by the Fermos and Romiansky uh, in that. Now, uh, now uh, in the case of care, things are much more complicated. Uh, if you have just the wave equation equal to zero, uh, there are results that go back to the Fermos and Romiansky, Tataru Tohmanianu, and Anderson Blue. Okay, so this so th this is the the main point I, I want to make. So the uh, the methods we are using, so we we have to treat, of course, with a nonlinear situation. The, but the method we are using is uh, goes back to Anderson Blue. So uh, it, it, the 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 Fermos Rodnyansky and Tataro Tofanian use something in Fourier space. In other words, you have to look at a more decomposition in order to uh, be able to treat the fact that the trap region. Uh, it does not, the trap region is, is, is more complicated. Uh, you don't have just one hypersurface. You have uh, an entire, an entire space-time region where trap null geodesis can, can, can have. And they, they have to uh, change the vector field method. They have to combine the vector field method with the decomposition in modes and choose the vector fields based on the modes. Uh, and this is, of course, a, 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 it was a very clever method, but doesn't work very well in, in perturbations because what are the modes? If I do a perturbation of the care solution, what are going to be the modes that I'm going to use? Uh, I mean, I, I'm not sure that the pro I don't think, I'm not saying that the problem cannot be solved, but it's going to be very difficult. The, the method of Anderson Blue is, is really a remarkable, it's based on a remarkable idea, which is, which actually extends the vector field method. So the vector field method really uh, allows you to commute the wave operators with various vector fields. The Anderson blue allows you to commute this with second order operators. So, uh, so this, this is a little bit of uh, the Anderson blue method. Uh, you see, uh, in addition of T and Z, which are killing vector fields, CARE possesses a high, high order symmetry, which is uh, what is called the Carter tensor. They exist uh, in care, they exist a tensor, which is symmetric to tensor, such that if I take uh, the derivative of K and I symmetrize, I get zero. Okay, so this is what I call pi, capital pi alpha beta gamma, it's a three tensor. It's identically zero for K, for exact K. This is exact K in, in care. So relative to bohr linquist coordinates, and actually the point is that you don't even need the bohr linquist coordinates, all you need is a frame. Relative to the horizontal frame, you have a, an O operator, which is, I mean, O, o tensor, which is this one, E1 tensor E1, and a C2 tensor E2. This is uh, O, and K is just a combination of the metric with a coefficient plus this O, right? Now, once I have the Carter tensor, I can define the Carter operator, which is uh, a second order operator. So this is a remarkable thing. It's a second order operator. It's d alpha k alpha beta d beta. And uh, the remarkable fact is that uh, because of this condition here, uh, the k commutes with, so this second order operator commutes with a wave operator. There is a also a fact too, which is very important also in, in, in their method, which plays a fundamental role also in our method. The, the, the important thing of everything here, by the way, there is one more thing. Uh, if I'm in perturbations of care, then I can construct a, a similar K, which is a perturbation of the one of care. And uh, in, in commutations, it's going to produce error terms which depend only on the pi. And the, prob the point is that the pi can be expressed only in terms of the frame. So, uh, so in terms of the uh, Christopher symbols of the frame. 
uh, and therefore somehow the error terms here can be treated exactly in the same way as all the other ter error terms that come up in stability of Minkowski or stability of Schwarzschild. So this is a sort of a, a remarkable fact that more, I mean, once you implement this, uh, this uh, uh, anderson blue method, you are really back to the same thing that you are doing anyway. So uh, almost all the error attempts can be treated in, in sort of a systematic way. Uh, they depend only on uh, these connection coefficients and so on and so forth. So this, this, is, a, this is a method that we are using. And I, as I mentioned in the uh, abstract of the talk, uh, this is something that we are doing together with uh, uh, Elena Georgi. So this is uh, joint work with uh, Jeremy Sasser and Elena Georgi. Okay, yeah. This Thank is you very much. So this complements uh, the, the remaining part, uh, right, the, the proof of stability of care. Uh, we, we, we have a result, Jeremy and I, in which we, we give a complete strategy and we prove all the main things with the exception, exception of this one. Of how to treat the GCM equilibrium, uh, how to treat GRW, and this will this will come up in a, in a forum, but this will come soon, hopefully. Right. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much for uh, the answers and the talk. So let's thank uh, Sergio again for a really interesting talk. And yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Nice talk, Sergio. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it's a lot of work, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know, unfortunately, it's unfortunately uh, that when there are so many steps that we have to do, but hopefully things simplify. So for example, stability of Mikowski space now can be done in a hundred page, not in, a, not in uh, the 500 pages that we had. So <laughs> this, this can be divided by a factor of five, and hopefully we'll only have two or 300 pages. Yeah, we're looking forward to more of, of simplifications. <laughs> Well, okay. Thank you so much. So um, I thank all the audience and um, especially Sergio for giving a long talk today. And so we will close this session and uh, hope to see you hopefully in person in the near future and to see you again. No, it's, okay. Thank you very, very much, uh, Lydia. Thank you, uh, Yao. And uh, uh, see you in, hopefully we'll see you in person in the future. Yes, right. Indeed, indeed. Okay. All the best. Good luck. Okay. Good luck. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.